Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, I'm uh, John, one of the co-owners here of Green Hut and now Cove Street Arts, about a mile away. And we are absolutely thrilled uh, to present Joel Babs to the Green Woods and Crystal Waters, uh, the show in the back there. And absolutely thrilled to have Joel here to speak with us today. Um, I've uh, actually written this down because uh, Joel's past year has been incredibly busy and I didn't want to try to memorize all of the things that Joel has been up to. Um, so aside from uh, completing the work for this exhibition, uh, earlier this year Joel was one of three 1969 Princeton alumni chosen to exhibit work and participate in a panel at Princeton's Lewis Arts Complex. His work is also uh, at the Bates College Museum of Art right now in its current exhibition, Uncovered, Selected Works from the Collection. In the fall of 2018, Joel also had <laughs> a solo exhibition at Bowdoin. And also in the fall of 2018, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts acquisition of one of his major cityscapes, Copley Plunge, was covered both in Bob Key's Portland Press Herald profile of Joel and in an American art collector spread. Uh, so it's been quite wow. the year. <laughs> uh, Joel Babb is a graduate of Princeton and the Boston Museum School, where he taught for several years. He has also taught at Tufts and Harvard Universities. His paintings have been exhibited in many museums and galleries throughout the Northeast and are in numerous prestigious corporate collections in several museums, including uh, the aforementioned uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Fogg Museum at Harvard, and the De Cordova Museum in Massachusetts. Um, I'm, I'm personally particularly excited to hear Joel talk today because I find his project, his process absolutely magical. Um, I remember walking through his studio for the first time and seeing a painting in progress. It was a canvas with an underdrawing. And then in just one corner, this almost chemical reaction was occurring. And it was spreading across the canvas with just color conjuring this whole new world into existence. Um, but obviously you aren't here to listen to me speak about Joel's process today, so let me turn things over to Joel back. Yes, thank you, John. Yeah. This is, yeah, it's unbelievable. Thank you. So many of you already know. You know, I think the majority of people here, have people that I've known some for a long time, like, uh, like this lady who taught at the Museum of Fine Arts back in the 19, pardon? She still teaches there. I, studied, I taught with her father, too, who taught there for how many years? 73 and a half. Yeah, 73 and a half. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is an amazing reunion. You know, not, not uh, I'm glad to see new people here that, that I'm just meeting for the first time, but it's, it's, it has been, an un, it, it is unbelievable. But uh, gee, you know, uh, John, I wish you would, uh, you know, I thought you did so well with the introduction. I, I wish you would fill in a little bit on the individual paintings because it, you know, <laughs> it sounds so much better than it seems to me just doing it. But um, the, uh, because, because I just come, I'm coming back from a 50th reunion. Uh, that has been a very strange experience. You know, how did 50 years go by so fast? And also, uh, you know, there are only three artists who have made their living from their artwork in my class of 825. Uh, and so it was just uh, many of them I have not seen for 50 years, inclu you know, including the two other artists who are in this show. And so, uh, I, you know, we, we discussed how Princeton affected our thinking about art and our art careers. And we were, we were, the three of us were wild sort of expressionists. And I, I was an abstract expressionist with a sort of a surrealist dimension, uh, interested in the unconscious and how it came to the surface in painting and what. And now, I mean, I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, we all three became realists. And I don't know if it's just the experiences of life that, uh, you know, did that to us or what it is exactly. We never got to the bottom of it, but we had a panel discussion uh, talking about that. The, uh, but I, I started thinking about beginnings and Jess suggested that I should bring in some of the drawings that were preliminary studies for the paintings in the show. So I have those things uh, that I want to show you. And uh, I just want to, I want to say, you know, as as I try to understand what happened, I think the first thing was being an art history major. And, and uh, it was a very good art department. There were nine 
uh, art history students in our class section. And the program was very good there. After, after graduation, I was able to spend a year in Europe and actually uh, made a point of seeing a lot of the things that we had studied. Uh, and so I entertained the idea of becoming an artist instead of being an art historian. I'm glad I made that decision because I would have been a terrible art historian. Uh, but particularly uh, being in Rome for several months had an influence on me. You know, once you've seen the Sistine Chapel and, and then you, you see the other great Renaissance works there, and then you think back to the great Roman stuff, and then you think about the Renaissance artists who, in effect, were trying to learn what the Romans could already do. You know, there were, that was what the Renaissance was all about. You really see that in Rome, the relationship between, between stuff of the high Renaissance and what the Romans, you know, how sophisticated and wonderful they already were. So, um, as I decided to become an artist, I realized I needed to sort of reevaluate what I was doing as a painter, I did not, uh, you know, I really did not have a masterful grasp of techniques and things. So I went to, I came to Boston and went to the museum school uh, to get an MFA. And instead of going on with the abstraction and things that they sort of recruited me to do, I started taking, uh, you know, fundamental uh, beginning courses and, and uh, learning techniques. Uh, we had a studio in the attic of the museum where you could copy paintings and actually did that too. And uh, unfortunately, as I got, you know, after Christmas, I came back to Boston. Uh, my father told me that, you know, we really didn't have any money anymore because I had two sisters in college. And so I had to find a job because I could go back if I wanted to. There was, uh, there was no way you could stop me. So I came back to came back to Boston, and the, the only job I could find that would enable me to still study was a night watchman at the Museum of Fine Arts. <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was a horrible come down from being at Princeton, uh, but it was probably a good experience uh, for a number of reasons, but actually for a young artist, it was the most amazing job you could have because every, every uh, night you're walking around the galleries, you have the whole gallery to yourself, you can turn the lights on. And so I had a sketchbook with me and I, I, was, I learned to draw basically copying uh, things in the, in the uh, galleries. Now somewhere around here, there's a little blue book floating around. I brought in one of the sketchbooks that I used to carry in my pocket. Could be in the back room. Ah, oh, I've got it here. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass this around. So flip through it and, and uh, you may recognize some of the objects here. But, but pass it around. I won't, I won't uh, take too long talking about it. But uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to think about why I had such a change of heart. Uh, you know, to uh, part of it was having studied art history and been to Rome. I had this feeling that somebody had handed me a, a violin, like a Stradivarius, and said, "Okay, now play." And I didn't know how to play. I couldn't begin to read music or anything. So uh, I have two sisters who are classical musicians, you know, and they, you know, they, they can play Bach, Beethoven, whatever. And I think, well, I need to do something like that uh, for my own work. And that's a very personal choice. You know, some people just, they want to take the latest trend and go with it and it works. But for me, I really needed to do, I, I needed to learn the basics more. So. I looked at my early work, uh, particularly in preparing for this talk at Bowdoin, and I, I realized that I had been studying Leonardo's uh, teachings and advice, and you know, advice to painters and stuff. And so, uh, you know, the Renaissance artists were learning what the Romans did. In a way, every individual artist who is going to practice the traditional form has to, has to sort of recapitulate that process uh, of learning. So the, uh, 
you know, I studied figure drawings that how Leonardo did it, and then I drew from the model. Uh, you study proportions. Uh, I studied anatomy. I actually went to BU Medical School and sat in on dissections for the, at least the musculature, you know, the outer, the outer part. And that was an amazing experience. It's an, and I think part of the fun of it was nobody was forcing me to do this. I was just doing it. Nobody else was really doing it particularly. And I made a particular study of perspective, you know, really you know, mechanical perspective, the way architects would do it and so forth. And when I first came to Maine, I drew the plants in the meadow that is the land that we live on now uh, in the sort of style that Leonardo did his studies of plants that might appear in the foreground of paintings. So his motion, uh, his study of the motion of the water are very interesting and I think that has really informed the way I think about uh, waves and things and seascapes and my paintings of rivers. And chiaroscuro is probably the greatest invention of Leonardo. And uh, I studied that too. So now uh, I want to show you, uh, because of something Jess suggested, some other drawings that were preliminary studies for paintings. So the, uh, the first one, actually this one right here, this is a study for Copley Plunge. So it's a cityscape, it's a view from a tall building in, uh, in Boston. And in that case, I had a series of photographs, but if you're if you are looking, if you are looking at this view from on top of a building, taking photographs, the streets as they go away from you are converging to a vanishing point on the horizon. But in my particular orientation, I turned the perspective system sort of 90 degrees down so that the vanishing point is down here at the bottom, and that is the point at which all the verticals in the buildings are converging to the vanishing point. So all of the other things, as you go farther and farther away, they just stay parallel to the side of the, of the picture. So none of these buildings would look just like that if you photographed it, because in the photograph, the streets would be coming to that vanishing point there. But this is, that's what gives this, the painting, the final painting, this peculiar feeling of drawing you down to that vanishing point the way you know, railroad tracks or a street going to a vanishing point pulls you into distance. This one sort of pulls you down. So this, this was a preliminary study for a painting in 1990 that was purchased by a collector in Maine. And it was recently donated by him to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And so I want to show you a picture of the painting in this book. By the way, this book, about my work. It's a wonderful collection of all the different things I've tried to do. So here, Copley Plunge, you can see in the actual painting, the vanishing point is outside, you know, it's below here. So when I was painting this, I had the painting set up on the easel, and I had a strip of wood across the bottom, and then I extended that down. I had a board extended down, I put a nail in that point, and I had a long stick with a notch in it, so I could move that, I could move that stick anywhere, you know, I was painting one of the verticals in the building, I would just move the stick over to the side and the br run the brush right along the edge of it there. So, so it's, it's actually, you know, it's a correct perspective, but not one that you actually, uh, and not exactly the way the eye looks at it or the camera looks at it. This is another of my experiments in perspective. Uh, it's, it's actually a construction in which things get larger as they go farther away, so that as you come up the street, the street gets wider. You see, it's, it has a certain logic to it. If I hadn't told you that I had flipped the usual perspective construction upside down, you probably wouldn't even have noticed it because there's something about, you know, there's something about the way space moves out from us and the old theory about how rays, vision is really the ray that comes from the eye and it bounces back somehow. So, you know, we sort of are the center of our own space. There's something about doing it this way that it, it maintains that logic, that same feeling. But it's, and I also explored, you know, the perspective in Chinese 
uh, cityscapes, Japanese uh, woodblock prints and things. So that is one case where the Leonardo, what, you know, that, my study of Leonardo led to that. So, uh, Now I want to show you another painting where the perspective, right, this is the smaller rolled up. All right, thank you. You may need to help me hold this up. Okay, now let's show them this. This is one of a series, yeah, how's that? Okay, they, this was a very wonderful commission that I got to paint uh, a painting of the first successful organ transplant, which was done at Harvard Medical School uh, uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, it had been done 40 years before, it was done in 1954, and, and the doctors who had done it commissioned me to do it, so it th the three doctors, the anesthesiologist, uh, the doctor who had been the chief of surgery, and then the Dr. Murray, who, who did the organ transplant, who got the Nobel Prize. So actually one of the things I had to do was go around with Murray, he took me through the ORs and I photographed a number of operations uh, to do this. So. Um, they couldn't remember exactly what the room was like because it had been demolished. So we had one or two photographs and they dug through the archives to get, you know, more, uh, uh, give me more of an idea what the room was like. And the doctors off to the left were actually the researchers, the chief of pathology, the people who did the, uh, all the research that led up to them being able to do this surgery there. But this is a one point perspective and I want, to, I want to compare it to, you can see what I did was create a checkerboard floor. Uh, I set the eye level above the heads of the viewers at the horizon line here. So, all, uh, so uh, the first thing I did in doing this drawing is lay out this grid of lines that are vanishing at this, at this uh, perpendicular vanishing point. Let's see. All right, let's, let's put this down for just a second. And... Pardon? It was a kidney transplant between two identical twins. So there was a donor operation in the background, the recipient operation in the foreground, and then the other doctors sort of as if they were outside a door in the room. But this is a famous drawing by Leonardo, which was a study for his adoration of the Magi. But you can see that's where I got that idea of the perspective construction, you know, by creating a checkerboard floor and drawing that first and then fitting other things to scale uh, and to move back into that space, you know. Now Copley Plunge takes this sort of thing and turns it so that you're looking straight down instead of into the distance, you know. But, but, but doing this uh, painting for the doctors, I had to sort of reimagine re the whole thing uh, because the room didn't exist and I had to change the point of view and so forth. So anyway, that's that. Do you want to look at that? Again, or is it you remember it? Eventually, this this entire scene. Once we got to this point, the entire scene had to be reversed because they remembered it. You know, after working on it for a few months, they remembered there was a set of windows on one side, and that the whole thing was backwards. And so, <laughs> so. But doing commissions is a very collaborative, thanks, that's, that's, it's a very collaborative process and very, uh, uh, that was a wonderful one. And the painting is at the Countway, uh, Countway Library? That is in the Countway Library. And they took down what famous painting? I'm not even going to say that, I mean, the, <laughs> I think that was the peak of my career because Harvard medical school took down a John Singleton Copley to hang my painting in there. I don't, I think, you know, at that point, 
Um, I don't think I could ever surpass that. Okay, I just wanted to show you what the final painting looked like. And the, if, they, if you're interested, they have this book. They have some copies of this book here. So this is, this is the painting as it finally ended up, you know, with the, <laughs> the doctors on the other side and the window. And so I, I had hired models and got people to pose for the individual uh, thing. So you have, you know, your, your figure drawing has to be very good. I've kept up my figure drawing even though I don't show my figure paintings, except for one exception, which is the, the group portrait, the conversation piece uh, in the back room there. All right, now, John, you can bring over the, uh, the large uh, rolled up thing. One of the things about doing commissions is that uh, Uh, I began to do, so you know, you, you do a design, you're making a proposal, and I would do a wash drawing, let's come around in front, which was the actual size of the contemplated painting. And so, uh, one of these wash drawings is on display at Bates. That's, that's what is at Bates today. But I thought I would bring, uh, I just bring this in because it just, it's very similar to the way I begin a painting. I do, you know, I draw something and then do a tonal underpainting, which works, which, which works out the pattern of values in the picture, where the lights and darks are going to be. And for this particular commission, for the Cambridge Savings Bank, uh, they didn't want to show much Harvard. But you, <laughs> because Harvard did not bank with them. And, even though they had the mortgages for a lot of Harvard uh, professors and stuff. And so I put Harvard in the shadows and, the, and we did a painting of the Weeks Bridge, the pedestrian bridge there. So this is, uh, so you know, the, the drawing was actually departing in terms of the light and shade, departing from uh, what the photographs looked like. It was a bright sunny day, there were no clouds when I took the photographs. But, but remember this because I'm going to show you some underpaintings for the paintings that are in this exhibition. And, and this, is, this is how I sort of learned to do underpaintings. Think of them this way. Okay, thanks. That is incredibly big, isn't it? Oops, thank you. The, uh, in the book, The, uh, the painting is illustrated, but it's also the frontispiece of the book. You know, that is the Weeks Bridge. So, you know, I've been doing these cityscapes from 4x5 chromes. A 4x5 camera, you take a transparency, like a big slide. and. Uh, some of the paintings were large. In fact, in the Charles Hotel at Harvard Square, the painting is five feet tall and 20 feet wide. And so I just had you know, a way of blowing them up from looking at these chromes under a, under a uh, magnifying glass. Uh, at one point then, I, said, you know, I, got, I thought, boy, doing these very detailed cityscapes, I applied the same technique, the same camera and everything to a scene in the Maine woods. Uh, because they've been building a house up in Maine since 1975. So, uh, I want to talk about this very large uh, eight foot tall painting uh, that I did and what sort of inspired it and show you two paintings that are related to this project. The first is, this, is the next one on top. It's a William Trost Richards painting. He is what has come to be known as an American pre-Raphaelite, meaning an artist who is under the influence of John Ruskin's writings in Modern Painters and other books like that. Now, I love, I love Ruskin, the uh, writer and critic, and this painting struck me as just the perfect example of an American pre-Raphaelite painting, where I think, I'm just, I'm not gonna talk about it a great deal, but 
in a nutshell, it is to approach nature with a sense of humility about what is there. You know, not try to use it as a vehicle for your own expression so much as to just show everything that's there. Because you make amazing discoveries just by looking very carefully and observing in a very realistic way. So in a, in a way, this is kind of like photorealism, except you know, in photorealism, when you blow things up, you begin to see things that you didn't notice when you were there. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think photorealism, the point is to make it look photographic and modern. The Pre-Raphaelites, of course, didn't, they may have used photography, I don't think so. Richards painted this thing outside, you know, he spent a great deal of time. The, this is actually bigger than the painting is. The painting is only probably 18 inches. And so he, he painted it outside, but he's not an Impressionist. And what I find interesting about American Pre-Raphaelitism is, is, uh, is the fact that there is a microcosm that draws you in in the foreground. Very careful observation, you know, many old master paintings, it's very perfunctory what's in the foreground, just a bunch of weeds and stuff. And, and, and yet here, you can become deeply involved in the study of individual leaves, the texture of bark, and what. And then as you go off into the distance, there's a hint of a macrocosm, you know, like a larger world, the normal world of what we think of the landscape painting in the background. So you're going from the very small to the very large. And the landscape paintings of the Dutch Baroque, like for instance, by, uh, well, well, any of them, uh, I, I won't pick anybody in particular, but there's very careful, a great deal of detail, and, and then you have a sense of vastness in terms of clouds and things and what, uh, what might be in the distance. So this is a quality that it attracted, uh, attracted me to. It's so lots of detail, but, but a microcosm and a macrocosm. So the other, the other painting at, that I was thinking about at the same time, we just we can leave this here in case I need to refer to it, is the next one. The, uh, this is actually a painting I discovered when I was a night watchman at the Museum of Fine Arts. It was down in storage. It has since been put up and uh, it's a very large painting by Gustave Doré who you, you might know his illustrations of Dante's Inferno and things, but I didn't even know he was a painter at that point. But this thing, the plants in the foreground are life-size. And then you have, uh, you know, the feeling of a distant, far-off thing there too. But say, I, I thought, you know, I love these, these particular flowers and things there. Uh, it gave me the feeling that you could just step over the edge of the frame and walk into the painting. So I thought, well, I will combine William Trost Richards, you know, very careful, humble detail with the, the scale here. With well, the Richards very small, there's no way you'd think you could step into that frame. But here, that's it. And so the painting that eventually came out of it was The Hounds of Spring. That is the painting right here. It's eight feet tall. The stones, the leaves, the plants in the foreground are life-size. And then as you go back, eventually you come up to this much more impressionistic sort of dissolving into space as you leave from the, you know, the world of the minute into the, into the world of the very vast. So uh, I don't, uh, this painting's actually down at Harvard Business School. Now, but it became, it inspired me to do a whole series of similar paintings in Maine. And I think the pictures that are in the back here are really, you know, as a result, they, you know, they all come from this one work. It's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, Impressionism, which I love, is very different. It's a snapshot 
sort of view, a very narrow field of view, and it's the way your mind sees something, maybe, you know, just off, in an offhand way. But it's the kind of thing we're very used to with, in photo photography, see? And so what's, what sort of drove me to make the painting so large is that they're, that they're different, you know? It's, it's, it's more like the feeling of the whole, the infinity of nature that way. So, let's see. The, uh, this painting of Gulf Hagus uh, I have a drawing for this too, would be the next one. But Gulf Hagus, if you know, how many have you been, been to Gulf Hagus? I know Jim, yeah, it's an incredible place. It's a long, a long walk in, but there's a series of waterfalls, you know, descending down through this chasm for a long time. I was taking photographs to use for this uh, with, a, with a digital camera and then uh, putting them together in this drawing here. This, so you can see this, let me see. The, the I mean, the interesting thing was that, uh, can you see it squared off? Yeah. The, what, what I found very interesting, I spent a lot of time at Gulf Hagas doing sketches and taking photographs. And at one point, the sunlight began to come down through the trees there. And it was just, you know, for about 15 minutes, it was absolutely beautiful. And I thought, well, that's got to be the theme of the painting, you know. The other, always one side was in light and one side was in shade. So I came back the next day to get a little bit of light on the other side, too. So you see, this is, it's derived from photographs. But, you know, like the other things, it's sort of changed by, the, by using a drawing and by sort of building the idea of how the painting is, what it's going to say, what it's going to work, uh, you, uh, by doing the drawings. So, that's great, yeah. So, um, now I want to show you some uh, drawings that relate to the eternal stream, which is one of the two, there are two large paintings that I did just for this show that I worked on actually for maybe three years off and on. Can you bring those? Uh... Paper? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then there's one of another drawing which is uh, a photo of the drawing. Yeah. So here, this is sort of like, you know, this is a sort of technique that I used to do for doing silver points, you would prepare paper uh, with, a, with a color and something that if you take a piece of silver you could make a line on it that proved not to be quite strong enough and so no the, uh, there's one that is just like this yeah so I can uh, I can actually is that sketchbook going around yeah okay we can, you can, I, I would like you to look at this up close and pass, pass it around too, because you can't really see it up close. This is the second drawing that I did for this, the Eternal Stream, the painting that's on the right in the back. So, you know, by, uh, I wanted to, with these, with these kind of drawings, to study exactly what the light is doing. Uh, how the light enters the painting and how it falls and it illuminates various things to different degrees. It doesn't really come out in photographs. And I have noticed, you know, I've gone to this place many times, taken photographs different times of day and so forth, and the place always looks different. So what eventually, these drawings have helped me to get a feeling for how I want to interpret the place in the light of my painting. So. Uh, I wish I, I wish I, did, I didn't I couldn't bring this drawing in, but but uh, you'll see the little one, which is loose, much looser, you know, than uh, the finished painting. This is this is for the other painting. This is a, uh, a uh, the same sort of thing heightened with white for the crystal pool. Too it takes and I and I'm I'm sort of right now in my work. I'm trying to explore more in terms of the drawings that that. Uh, take it away from just simply working and painting what is in the photograph. Okay, leaves here. Now I want to show you some uh, some some of the steps that I do from going from the drawing to a painting. So yeah, hey, take it easy there. <laughs> yeah. 
That's it. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Right. This is this is the crystal pool, which I just showed you the drawing for, and at the underpainting stage, where John was talking about the alchemy of turning this, you know, when you begin to add color, this is before you add the color. This is when you just have worked out the values in the painting. And I do it with, I do it by dividing the photograph into five inch squares. First I enlarge the photograph till it's the size of the finished painting, then I divide it all into five inch squares in Photoshop so that I can look at just one section at a time and draw that with a pointed brush with these transparent browns and yellow browns and black. And so I have basically translated the thing that was in that drawing to, to the beginning of the oil paints. Now, so that, that means that when I'm adding the color, I'm never really comparing it to white, but to a value that's already been established. And I also keep in mind where the lightest lights are, you know, and in this particular case, I, I heightened them right from the very beginning. And over here on the side, you can see my palette, which is arranged so that there are very light lights together and there are very, there are middle tones together and there are shades together. You know, so that I'm always, when I'm mixing colors, I'm always thinking about where I am in the value scale from light to dark. Here, you can see the, I have the photograph, uh, and, uh, you know, just showing the part that, that I happen to be working on at that, at that point. Okay, that's great. Are we going to look? Photo of the actual or a photo of your drawing? What do you say? say that again? Is it? Yes. No, the photograph is of the place. Yeah, no, that's an important question. Because, and actually, you know, because I abandoned the uh, use of the four by five transparencies and I began to use digital photography and Photoshop, I could, I could say take nine pictures of the view and then merge them together in Photoshop and there's just a great deal of a detail in there just as much as from the 4x5s, only the exposures can be uh, done more easily. You know, when you're, when you're taking transparencies, you'd have to take one shot for the lights and one shot for the darks and then put it all together somehow. Bring the other, uh, the next one of those. Uh. And so I generally, you know, I would have, yeah, yeah. I generally would have uh, if I took a hundred photographs, it might end up being five different compositions, you know, then, and then I would say, well, which one's going to be the best? And, and uh, so here's a, here's a little, this is the view for the Eternal Stream, the other, the other painting. And you can see it only is worked down, not all the way down, but you can't see in the photograph, but it's divided into five inch squares and I'd be drawing what I saw in each square that way. And I think that's my favorite way of working. Off to the side, you see what I have there is a, is a, a sort of value study. It's a black and white version at full size of the composition that I'm painting. You know? Now I brought in one of those things. We'll get that two to look at. And I think these, the, well, you know, you should, if you want to look at these more closely, they'll be over on the table there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is... This is the crystal pool. And, you know, it's... it's I have these... I have the images in the computer of what the thing looks like in color. But I think it's quite fascinating how this relates to the drawings, uh, you know, to what the values are and what the light is coming. And I almost, you know, think this is just as interesting as the thing in color to be able to, uh, to see it this way. But you can see what an amazing amount of detail you can get by just using a 35 millimeter camera if you merge all those individual parts into, into you know, it's almost like having an 8 by 10 camera or something 
there, except you have to be, practically have to be Ansel Adams in order to be able to take a shot of the woods like this and to get all the values and everything. It's just incredibly difficult. But my photography really, I'm always thinking about how I'm going to paint it, not if the photograph is perfect. You know, I'm thinking about what do I need to do to do the painting. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, All right, I think this should, there's only one more drawing, and that relates to the small painting in the back. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I was thinking about doing this as a very large painting, and I came up with two alternatives, and this was the rejected one. And then I decided to do this as a smaller painting, which is the one in the show here. And it's actually, it's Mount Desert, uh, like the subjects of my earlier show here, but it is, it is actually created by merging four different locations on Mount Desert Island. The, you know, this is a completely different place uh, from this, and of course this is from yet another place there. It's a, and so I call it Mount Desert Capriccio. And I'm thinking really about Canaletto and his caprichos because he might have, you know, he might take two buildings that are nowhere near each other in Venice and paint them together uh, sometime as just as a decorative thing. Or he might invent a, uh, say, a uh, Palladian style bridge to replace the Rialto Bridge in one of his paintings. You know, some of them are quite elaborate architectural fantasies. And I think, you know, and that is so. Uh, that is very impressive. It's not, you know, you're far from just uh, copying photographs at that point. Uh, getting them all to go together is, is quite interesting. And yet I've seen many cases where, say, Frederick Church and, and Cole and Bierstadt have done the same thing. You know, we, we are so used to uh, photography and just assuming that every, you know, everything derived from a photograph is is exactly the way it was, that it's not, you know. The, there was a show of Bierstadt's painting in Mount Washington down at the Courier Museum, and Bierstadt's brother was a photographer. And some of his other paintings are almost exact transcriptions of his brother's photographs, like the view in Conway. They had both of those things there. So his view of Mount Washington was 200 different studies and possibly some photographic things too, but he put them together and, what, and you realize what was actually an impossible view is the best summation of the whole experience there. And so I'm kind of thinking about, you know, where is this going to lead me in, uh, in future paintings. This is, it looks very much like Mount Desert, but actually it's not a particular place at all. Okay. So that's the painting, that's a painting in the back room there. So that's, uh, that is basically uh, what I want what I wanted to say, what I wanted to talk about, and uh, you know how the how my early studies have just you know they've just opened up so many different uh, other opportunities. The, I also hope you have read this artist statement that's up on the wall in the back there because I thought about this a good bit, and and uh, it does talk about green woods and crystal waters having been a show that was curated by by John Arthur some years ago that traveled around the country and I was in that show. But I discovered then that to the green woods and crystal waters was actually a quote of this George W. Sears, you know, and it was about uh, camping as a way to cure the ills of modern life and so forth. And so I, I think, you know, I have painted many, many cityscapes of Boston and I love Boston, and I love architecture and all that, but I choose to live out in the woods of western Maine, you know, far from civilization, to be able to go out and walk down my own woods every day. And so Sears thinks that that is basically the cure for many, many things. And I think, you know, our whole understanding of nature and the need for it. This reminded me immediately when I thought about it, was writing this of the poem by Yeats, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, which is quoted in the artist statement. You should read it. Uh, and I think it was because the poet was in London for a time and he saw, an ex he saw in a shop window a sort of a fountain and the water was dripping and just the dripping sound of the water 
made him remember this having been on Innisfree, and he had this fantasy in the poem of the, this lake island where he was gonna leave everything behind and go live this life of simplicity and beauty there. I think, you know, there is a deep human uh, need for that. And I think that is very, uh, it's what I'm getting at in a lot of these scenes of Brooks. Uh, you know, the sound, the motion of water. So read the statement and, and uh, think about that too. So we got plenty of time for questions and, and uh, yeah. Well, I was fascinated by one of the things that you did have done, which was go to a medical uh, dissection laboratory. Yes, yeah. Then she did, and uh, is that part of a uh, art, uh, college art training? Do, you have, do they have an opportunity? And I always say it's <laughs> yeah. Renaissance days, but it's intense. Yeah, no, no, that's, <laughs> that, it, it may be somewhere, but I don't know, yeah. you know. Sneak in. <laughs> no, no, it is, uh, but I mean, I, did, I was going to teach a course in art, anatomy for artists, yeah. And so I said, okay, I can do that. So I had to really start learning fast. And, and so, you know, the people at BU, they, they let me come in and sort of audit it, at least the first part, you know, the first semester. And, and uh, no, it was, it's, I mean, I think it really should be, but uh, even, even the, uh, the people who do the uh, atelier program where they sort of resurrected the French 19th century method of drawing from plaster casts first and then you know learning to learning to paint exactly a certain way uh, I'm not sure that even they do that but uh, I think if I had to you know I, teaching in the art school I thought boy this place is really uh, it's sort of uh, anarchic it's like do, do more a little bit do your own thing uh, find your own language and so forth, and so it's not it's not in the art schools anymore. And Leela, I see her shaking her head because she, we both believe it should be. And she she had that kind of training at BU. I didn't have that kind of training, and because I got a letter of recommendation from George Siegel, the the plaster cast uh, person, you know, they took me in uh, and got me in the master's program there, but. But because I wasn't forced to do it, I really enjoyed it. I just loved it, and it took it. It uh, you know, I felt a deep a need and resonance to study that. But it it is an amazing you know. I, I remember just driving around looking at people after seeing the dissections and said, "Oh my gosh!" You know the it's <laughs> it, the machinery and everything. You become so aware of it, and it's it's fascinating. And, you know, happy. Yeah, I haven't read the Isaacson book, but I'd love to. You know, uh, no, I had the uh, I had the the Dover facsimile of his of the two books of his writings and things. So this is a big Leonardo year. It would be great to go see some of the shows and things. Uh, They did? Yeah. There's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, yes. Oh, okay, good. You know, you know my secrets now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how much artistic license can you take before you start to get concerned about messing with God's work or something? You know? Yeah. No, that's a that's a that's a very good question. So. It's a great uh, yeah. Um, I think 
if Church or Bierstadt did it, it was to capture the spirit of the place even better than any particular view would do. So, you know, it's a little bit like the, the classical thing about, okay, to make, to paint the most beautiful woman, do you go around and find the most beautiful eyes, the most beautiful nose, the most beautiful, uh, you know, shoulders, and you copy the best part of each and put them together? Or do you just go find the most perfect woman and just paint her? You know, so the, uh, I don't think I'm in any danger of doing, of uh, <laughs> destroying the, yeah, no, I'll have to think about it. <laughs> I'll have to, yeah, because, you know, I mean, my early paintings, it was all about my unconscious and my expression of my feelings, and so, the extreme opposite of that is this American pre-Raphaelite thing, which is, okay, no feelings, no drama, no art, just, you know, just a direct contact with what is actually there. And so I realized that that is an extreme position because good paintings have a life of their own that has to be discovered and, you know, it, you have to interpret nature to an extent. And so if that interpretation gets to the point where it's just, my neuroses or my idiosyncratic feeling about the place, then yeah, I think it, I think it loses validity and and uh, you know, and also one of the interesting things about realism, I think it's per, it's perennially of interest. You know, many fashions come and go, but something about something about the classics and the realism, you know, it's, it's always going to be interesting, no matter. Uh, I had a significant other who died in 2014 at age 95 and a half. And when Joel had an exhibition at the Bowes Gallery in Boston, I took Mel, and on the third floor was this tall painting, almost as tall, I think, as that wall, somewhat narrower, of a woodland scene. And Mel had been brought up in the country and had moved always to the city. And I could not get this man to move up the rest of the gallery floors. Mm -hmm. He stood in front of that painting, I think, for two hours. It was so cathartic for him. It just restored his soul. And I think that's exactly what your paintings do for people. Wow. <laughs> yeah, here, here. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I ask one other quick question? That I wonder how long does it take you to do the, the, the yes. scene that you showed of the study of um, Harvard across the river? Oh yeah. Um, that yeah. That, that's a work of art in itself. How long does it take you to do, to do that drawing? Probably a week or so. Yeah, that painting is still hanging, I believe, at the Cambridge Savings Bank at Harvard Square, but it's up, uh, upstairs, but you can see it from, in, in, in some ways, it's uh, one of the best cityscapes I ever did, but uh, right, the one in the Charles Hotel is still there too, you know, the 20-foot uh, the wide one, and I'll just say, I'll tell you just one more anecdote about that, it's a young artist and Portia Harkis, who had the most fashionable gallery in Boston at the time, was the art consultant. And so she had seen a painting of mine down at the Newport Art Museum, and, and for some reason she gave me the commission to do this painting for the lobby, and there were a lot more famous artists who also did paintings for the Charles Hotel. But we established the price of $4,000 first, and then we established the size of the painting. And she had a painting that was five feet square, and so she said, okay, look at this painting. And I thought, okay, five feet. Then she rolled it over once, twice, oh. right? five times. And she said, it's going to be 20 feet wide. And so I said, okay, <laughs> you have me over a barrel. I, I really wanted to do it. And uh, I said, it also had to be done in seven weeks. And so, but that's just, that's fun. But I teach art. Very much interested in art education. When they teach art, 
It would seem logical that it would be the reverse the way you went to art, that abstract first. Do they teach the students realism and structural drawing first and then let them go the other way? And uh, it, how, how, how difficult for you was it to transition from what you were doing to To go back to the, yeah, you know, that was really a tough time because uh, not only were you going against the grain of contemporary art, and if you're doing uh, the things I was doing, people said, I don't know where you're coming from. <laughs> you know? And so uh, nobody would really want to show it or anything. And I think the paintings I did in the 70s are really quite interesting now. And when you, if you look through the book, it's quite interesting to see, yeah, they're very old master looking. That was just to so totally off of the, uh, what everybody was talking, thinking about hard edge abstraction and stuff. I think it's natural for young people to want to see the latest development and start at that point, you know? And it, it, because I remember when I was young and, and I went to the art museum, I went right to the modern sections first and I was just bored out of my mind with the old masters. And, uh, you know, I love Marcel Duchamp, I love Franz Klein, uh, I loved uh, what, whatever, I was open to all that stuff. And so, I'm, not that I'm closed-minded today, but I know personally what I'm interested in. And the, the old master only, it, they're hard to get into, they're hard to really uh, get to the bottom of, you know, they, there's a lot of depth there. And you keep looking at them year after year after year, and you see more and more every 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 time. So in an art education, I'm not quite I'm not quite sure because I know if I'd been forced to follow a regimen, I would have rebelled. Anyway, and I know I was just naturally interested in the new stuff, but going back and starting over was humiliating because I realized I thought I was a sophisticated, you know, highly educated and really onto things, and then I realized I don't know anything and I can't do anything, you know, I handed the violin and I can't play, and it's embarrassing. And so it was, it, it actually, it happened very fast though. Uh, without, you know, I, I learned without even, I, I don't know how, but uh, being in the museum and teaching in the museum and uh, seeing many, many shows over, over many, many years, is, it was wonderful too. And, and sometimes I thought, you know, people have said, well, if you're not a member of a school, you're not exchanging ideas with, with all the, you know, your colleagues who are working on a particular problem and you're just out on your own all by yourself. You know? Well, you're not by yourself because, you know, you're with Delacroix and Titian and all of these fabulous minds, you know, who lived in other periods. And so, you know, learn about the history of the period and, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's fantastic. So, somehow we got to come back a little bit from the extreme, extreme obsession of just the new and newest and latest in art education. Yeah. Um, wonderful talk, Joel. Thank you. Uh, your art is, uh, well, you learned to play the violin. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Let's put it that way. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if you have taken us through the development of your skills um, and interests from abstraction to realism, yeah. from the city to the country and the operating room. What's next? <laughs> where, does, where do you think you will be centering your attention a few years from now? Well, I don't know. I hope, uh, I hope I will not be doing more medical paintings from the point of view of my bed in a hospital somewhere, <laughs> but I hope I, I hope I'm out in the woods and I am doing a series of cityscapes which I just, I feel renewed interest in doing cityscapes too. And, and applying some of the ideas that I've been exploring in these drawings, you know, about controlling the light and making my cityscapes more dynamic and interesting as paintings. Uh, I, I did some paintings, uh, five paintings, views from the Harvard Club downtown Boston. And, and so I'm going back to these you know, to these sort of wide surveys. I would do some smaller cityscapes too, exploring the ideas. I don't know if I'll do caprichos of Boston architecture, but that's one thought. But I discovered that you can go to the top of the Customs House in Boston, which was that very, you know, very tall, almost like an obelisk 
building that used to be a federal building and so it was exempt from the height restrictions in, that Boston had at the time. But uh, it has, uh, and it used to be the tallest building downtown, but it has uh, been turned into a Marriott Hotel and it has this wonderful observation desk, uh, these uh, balconies all around it, all, all four sides, uh, right at the base of the pyramidal top of there. And you can visit uh, a couple times a day, they let you come up and it's not very crowded and it's just incredible views of the harbor and the, the downtown buildings, you know, and, and so I know that that is one of the next things I'm going to be doing, but in the spirit of trying to bring the sense of light uh, that I've discovered in these paintings of the woods. Yeah. Yeah, Lisa. One comment, um, since I've known Joel for many years as a student, back before Massachusetts was a common problem a long time ago. But, um, and, uh, you know, in having really interested in, in the technical part and learned so many more layers of your process that I didn't know that I thought I know. One of those situations, again, where you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I really loved the most was learning about the, you know, um, your inspiration from Yates. And uh, because when I look at the landscapes, you know, I think kind of drawing from a very foggy memory from art history of a painting by Fragonard, like Return from Acadia, something like that, where it's sort of a sen romantic sense of utopia that is never really attainable. But I, I feel this really strong sort of spiritual pull, which is, and I'm saying that only because I feel that that is such a strong component and one of the things that I'm really drawn to where there's the macro, micro to the macro, but when you sort of get to that little sliver of light that is small but so significant and it alludes to this very mystical and mysterious um, uh, path that goes, you know, no one knows where, but it's so alluring um, and so universal that I, you know, I think it's really, um, just wonderful that you sort of captured that feeling, but kind of gotten to it from all of this technical expertise. Yeah, that, that is a thank you. But that's a, that's a really interesting uh, comment because, yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it is quite demanding and you know, there's a lot of technical this and that, but ultimately that's not the purpose of doing the painting. So. I wrote a little bit in that statement about how the, uh, those streams have become to me sort of, sort of a uh, meditation on the whole concept of time and thinking about time, you know, because as we talk about the, the stream of time, you know, flows down from the past or it flows away from us, you know, what's past and then uh, the future arrives. And so as soon as you say, this is the present, as soon as I said that, it's no longer the present, it's the past, you know. And so when I when I'm spend a day by a brook, I never think of it as wasted time, but I begin to think, I begin to think about time uh, in a way I don't think of it with the seascapes and stuff. I think natural forces and over time there's erosion and so forth. But uh, it's interesting how natural phenomena do, there's a whole set of ideas and beliefs and whatever that are related uh, to them, whether you know, it's just because of the way we are built. So. <coughs> Have any questions about individual paintings? I, I, I'm done, but I would say you know the, uh, the the group portrait is titled a conversation piece, which is an English term from the 18th century about conversation piece where people are talking and you do a group portrait. And so that's what that is. It is uh, uh, from that porch on a house in Biddeford Pool, I did the other, I did four paintings uh, last summer. And so some of those paintings are there. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's uh, I, love, I love the painting. It was, uh, And it makes me want to do more figure paintings too, more portraits and more uh, 
uh, painting because I, you know, I work on my figure drawing all the time. I, I draw from the model every week, at least once. And, and in the past, I painted the figure a lot, but I've never shown the work. But yeah. Okay, I guess we should wrap it up, please. Yeah, thank you.